I'll give you a proper introduction and post, which I always do, but so we can just have a casual conversation. I'll just, I wish there was a way for me to illustrate to the listener where we are sitting, the environment that we are in right now. (laughs) Museum isn't actually a good enough word because that feels old. Like this is living history that we're in. It's the house dad built. You know, he built it all on his own. He, he got the Horatio Alger Award, which is a big deal because people that make it to where he did came from abject poverty, right? He grew up on a sheep farm in poverty, right? And he, by his own sheer will and common sense, made it to the top, right? So, I mean, he, he created this whole empire and he was sick. He was sick as a kid, right? And and at 15 years old, he almost died. He had a mastoid. You could touch his ear with the pin. And the pain was so great, he'd go out of his mind, right? And he was eating cakes and pies and sugar and really bad food. And um, my grandmother, his mother, took him to a seven-day Adventist thing. And they took him to Paul Bragg's seminar, which is, you know, Bragg's Aminos? I do, right? yeah. I use the... Um Apple cider vinegar. Oh, it's amazing, yeah. right? He attended a Paul Bragg seminar, and Paul Bragg said, if you obey nature's laws, you can be reborn again. And my dad never forgot that, and he actually brought dad up on stage and made an um, example of how you're not supposed to look, right? After that, my dad joined the YMCA. He changed his diet. That saved his life. And my dad was so fanatical about it that he wanted to bring this message to the world, right? He started the first gym, but the gyms back then were sweat boxes. They were dirty. They were disgusting. But my dad put carpeting in, mirrors, plants, to make people want to come and work out, Fascinating. right? That was his contribution. And he couldn't get any business at the time because if he, at that time, you would be considered, you know, muscle bound, stupid. Um, women will get, uh, you know, they won't be able to bear children, um, all this stuff. So my dad went to the schools and got the kids. Go to the parents. He said, look, you're a fat kid. I'm going to take 50 pounds off him and gain 10 pounds of muscle or your money back. Double your money back, right? You're skinny kid. I'm going to add 20 pounds of muscle and, you know, I'll add 25 pounds or whatever, Right. And my dad got results. Sorry. No, it's okay. My my dad got results. So I guess he started his gym. He started to get busy. And then, you know, he was asked to be on television. He never wanted to be on television. And he just kind of fell into it. He had no formal training, no nothing. He just invented his show, Mm. right? He just, you know, it was sponsored one year. And the sponsor pulled out and the show went over so well, my dad said, I've got to keep this message on the air. I've got to keep this, get this to the American people, right? And so <clears throat> he had to invent products to sell, to stay on the air, to pay the bills. So he started supplements, started the first protein powder, started the, the stretcher. Just He had to invent stuff. And so, you know, I look over and and at my mind, you know, why was I so intrigued why my surfboards didn't work? You know, like, like, I I think I have a lot of that same mind in me, you know. I'm not nearly as famous or I have not nearly made the contributions to society that he has. But, you know, for me, I think surfing is a gym in and of itself. Right? I mean, that lifestyle, you look at surfers and, and how long they live and how good they look when they get older, there's something about this sport. Sure. Right. Um, I hope I didn't go on too long. <laughs> there's no better place to go on too long. The podcast is the perfect <laughs> medium to go on long. Um, but I, so much that I want to dig into. I'm trying to figure out the right path to go first. Let me ask you, though. Came from abject poverty, starts, you know, kind of experiencing a little bit of success with something 
with something like um, starting a supplement company, who funded that kind of stuff early on? Did okay. he bring on investors? Back, back, back then, it was easy to do stuff. Okay. Right? It was easier. The prices weren't so high. Um, you know? Uh that's a good question on how they got the capital to start, but he started small, right? And, and he had friends around. I'm sure he got a little bit of money. He was on TV for a year, mind you, right? So we probably did get a couple of people to invest to start this. Right? Gotcha. And, you know, like if you, if you look at Instant Breakfast, um, Carnation's Instant Breakfast, right? It's been around for, you know, almost 60 years now, probably. And he invent mom and dad invented it in San Francisco. They said, we need something you can drink. We need something that's quick, on the go. And we had it out on the market, and we were in Hollywood at the time, and we took it down Carnation to get instantized. Well, the FDA comes along and says, oh, well, you can't claim this, you can't claim that, you got to pull it off the shelves. Well, yeah, but it's kind of like having an egg. It's kind of, you know, and you can't have an exercise booklet with that because that's not substantiated. Well... Two years later, Carnation comes out with their instant breakfast. Right. Like, oh, oh, you guys and buddies with the FDA, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So we took him to court, and we, we won the case. The judge ruled that anybody could use instant breakfast, and you know, we went on to make other other items. Right. right. But I mean, you know, protein powder, the protein bar too. Dad, we had one of the first protein bars. Tiger Milk came out shortly thereafter. Right. right. You know, and and uh, you know, my dad was was brilliant. He was he was brilliant. He was sharp. Because, I mean, he, he, was, he was so sickly as a kid. And he almost, was, he was a death store. When you're, when you're in that situation, man, you, you know, just being alive is a plus, right? You know. Um, these stories, you're telling them so vividly. Where did you hear these stories? Was your dad a storyteller? Did you hear them from him directly? Over and over okay. and over and over again. It, it got to the point where, you know, we'd had gifts over. He would not stop preaching about it he's a preacher for the here and now yeah right he's always telling people you got to eat natural foods you got to keep exercising you got to keep moving if you stop moving it's death right these world war ii vets would come home well actually it's interesting my friend brian hilbers who's he's a shaper fine yeah. line yeah yeah brian hilbers is the most intelligent shaper on the planet in my opinion right he said something very interesting. He says that World War II vets were at death's door. When they came back, <clears throat> they said, you know what? We're going to live life, right? It, it kind of started the action sports industry. Started riding motorcycles and skiing and surfing, right? Because we, we, we were there. We're going to live our life a little fuller, right? But the average American at retirement would sit down and watch television, Right? So the, all these diseases were popping up. When my dad came on the air, he changed everything. He saved a rich nation from poor health through the medium of television. A whole country, and that went international. Yeah. Well, we, we had the show in Russia. We had a guy from Mongolia at one of the trade shows a couple of years ago come down and give my mom a plaque. Thank you for your message. Crazy. My dad's message was simple. You know, it was, it, it's simple. Layman, layman can understand. There's a lot of science behind it now. You know, got to mix course. this with that. But, you know, if you do, if you use your common sense and try to eat things that aren't processed and exercise, yeah. you're doing better. You, maybe you don't have to have your book so much, right? If you got a weight problem, you know, you, you, you should count your calories. Sure. I mean, I was working in restaurants and I got a little heavy myself and dad got me a calorie book and I followed it and... And I lost weight, and I just decided I wanted to be lean and mean like Bruce Lee and not bulky. You know? So, so many kids that are raised under, like, strict dogma from their parents, whatever it may be, rebel against it. Given that your dad was kind of cramming this stuff every direction, yeah. every time people came over, like you said, how did that affect you? Did you embrace the message? I mean, it was nuts. Did you rebel? I mean, my dad was, like, rock star status back then. You know, like, like, what was it like growing up? And I said, I don't know anything different, so I don't have anything to, to compare it to, you know. But one thing I noticed around me, I noticed a lot of happiness, right, in L.A. A lot of happiness. 
lot, like I saw some of my mom and dad's social um, activities. They'd have people over and I went, I was in school and, you know, I remember inviting my friend's parents to my birthday parties. You know, you, I guess you didn't really hear about that much. You know, it was, it was like, you know, I, I, I don't know why I was drawn to it. I, I didn't rebel. I rebelled by surfing. And, and, and I'll give you a good, good instance about how surfing was viewed back in those days. My dad, you know, he had his television show. I'm in Pepperdine. I came out of nowhere, man. I, I wanted to surf so badly, and I, I struggled at it. It took me over a year to learn to stand up. It was horrifying. I couldn't figure it out. Man. So you were living in Hollywood? Hollywood. Hollywood surfing yeah. Malibu? Surfing with Clark Gable's son, John, whose brother was Bunker Spreckles. Yeah. And we stole Bunker's lightning bolt. No way. And took it on the bus to Santa Monica, and if he were here now, he'd kick our you-know-whats. Yeah. Right? So we would go and hang out at Malibu, and we were like 15, 16, right? And Danny Hilton, Paris's uncles, right? Bobby Darren's son. We all surf. And mom took me to Hawaii when I was nine. I stood up. Well, anybody can stand up in Hawaii, right? When they took me to Santa Monica, I mean, I was a laughing stock. I said, oh, I know how to surf. I'll go with you guys. And they were just, they gave me, I was humiliated, right? And then we went down to Tim Disney's house um, in Capistrano, Walt Disney's grandson. And uh, I, I finally I finally got it. It was through repetition, repetition. When I got into Pepperdine, I was at third point, And this is in like 1978 or nine. And I paddled up the third point. The first thing I see, I get in someone's way. Get the f*** out of here. Get the f***. Don't come back until you learn to surf. It was Alan Sarlo. I was going to guess Alan Sarlo. Okay, but there was another guy out there who surfed with his shorts around his neck, naked, Mickey. And he told me, don't ever come back until you learn to surf. You could not go to third point and be a kook. You can't have a surf school out there. You had to earn your spot there. And I, you know what I did? I was raised strict. I was raised to uh, respect my elders. So I went to Sunset. I went to Sunset for a whole year and I became a local there. And I met all the guys from Venice that frequented that point, right? And I got my sea legs there. And I remember going back up to third point and spraying Mickey in the face with my twin fin. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I sprayed his ass. What did he have to say about that? You know what he did? Yeah. I mean, he's probably... Good job. He's on a log, I he, would imagine. No, no. He's on a, he's on a pintail. Really? Because you know, it was like seven O's. Okay. Back then, the sti- we had Stinger. It was... It, twin fins really weren't there yet. Yeah. You know? I mean, we had the seven six pintail... Um, there was a lot of single fins, but they were starting to shrink down. 78, 79 with the Bonzer, Campbell Brothers. You know, they always were showing their board off. That was a thruster. I mean, it was somewhat of a thruster, right? I had, I had, a, I had a Bonzer at that time. I had a Stinger, uh, a Rick Stinger. Um, and then when I got into Malibu, um, you know, I, I, I sprayed, um, I didn't spray John Gable and, and uh, Hilton. I just got way better than those guys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like, wow, John, you're, you're, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you guys drove it to me. It, this, this is why, like, you know, getting bullied and harassed and, you know, it, it builds you. Oh, yeah. It builds you. You know, if someone said, oh, there, there, Johnny, it, it, I would have never had the drive to do what I did, right. you know, and, and in a very short amount of time. I, you know, I was the collegiate champion of the NSSA, of the Northern Conference, you know? So, I mean, a lot of that discipline that your dad yes. preached. Yes. It was embedded in you. Yeah, but I was rebelling at the same time. Right. Because when I won the Northern Conference championships, I called my mom and dad. I just won the NSSA Northern Conference championships. I did a 360 in the finals. 
with 300 people on the beach and kicked everybody's butt. And my mom goes, oh, we're so proud of you, John. We're so right. And my, my dad gets on the phone. And he goes, oh, you don't get enough exercise from that surfing crap. Hilarious. <laughs> I was devastated. You know, like, you know, it, 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 that was a tough one. Yeah. You know, but you look at surfing now. I mean, you know, I stuck at it, right? And, and uh, it was really rough in those days, man. I mean, the fights... That were, that were out in the water, the localism, the competition was nuts. It, it was like um, gladiators out there. Yeah. Third point especially. Because we, we had the El Nino for four years straight. I just moved into Malibu. And I thought every winter was like this. Warm water, four to eight feet every single day breaking in Malibu. I mean, I'm on a third point every October. By myself with one other guy. There was no surf line. There was no surf report. Right. You know, I had third point to myself for almost a half a decade. Crazy. Every fall and every spring because nobody, well, Malibu's not breaking. Right. But Malibu breaks all year round, but nobody knew because everybody's over the hill. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a big population in Malibu in 79. Yeah. Right? And, and when the 976 numbers came out, that started getting a few more people to the beach, right? You know, um, in, in off season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would imagine your dad would have been uh, difficult to please no matter what level of success you would achieve in life because he was so driven. Did he ever see the value in surfing throughout your life? Years later. I remember when he was on his tour, he, he you know, he, when I won the Northern Conference Championships, I think he kind of turned around a bit um, because when he'd introduce me to some events and things like that, he says, oh, my my son's a world champion surfer, okay. you know, right? So, so he, he would address proud. me as that, you know. Yeah. He, my, my son's the captain of the Pepperdine surf team and he even announced it on one of his shows in 84. Gotcha. Because I, I won the Northern Conference Championships in 83. Gotcha. Right. So so he, he, he started to get it after a while, you know. Yeah, I mean there's multiple things happening. Like it's so counterculture and it was so, uh, I don't know, maybe frowned upon oh, yeah. for a certain period of time. If you go back far enough, it was regal, you know? And so then, sure. then it was venerated, but it certainly went through a phase where it was the outcasts did it and the burnouts maybe did it. And so I could see your dad being, um, concerned about it from that point of view. But then secondly, I would, you have to appreciate the athleticism of it. You know, so I would think there would be an element of it where it's certainly, it'd be better than your kid going to do some frivolous pursuit that didn't have any athletic benefit to it. Like there's something athletic, but also there's a spiritual aspect. It could be, sure, I could see him sure, finding value in sure, it. Sure, you know? sure. And he did find value in yeah. it later on. And Good. and the older he got, the more he bragged about it. Cool. Right? Good. Um, but at the time, you know, he's at the top of his game and he wanted me to be lifting weights. And, yeah. you know, I know he... He always wanted me to be an individual. Good. You know, he wanted me to be myself, but deep down inside, I think he wanted me to follow in his footsteps. And, you know, if you think about it, I kind of have. I mean, wherever I <clears throat> go, I guess it's just embedded in my psyche. I, I always try to share what I know with people. Like, if I know something, I'm going to tell you about it, right? If I, You know, the a good example would be the shark surfer, that, that YouTube sensation video remind me okay i'll show it to you after our i've actually seen it now that i uh, do remember i'm him yes i remember it now the reason i got that gig is that i was out at malibu and there was one other guy next to me and he looked like he was in prison picking up the soap i'm going dude no i said can i give you some constructive criticism please i said you gotta get your butt over your heels pretend like you're sitting in a chair and get your knees in that's proper stance, yeah. right? It, without, without the proper stance, you're going to pick up bad habits. It'll take years to correct it. Son of a gun. Year, a year later, I'm in Venice. Hey, John. Hey, remember me? You told me that I had a bad stance. That really worked. By the way, can you surf behind a moving object? I said, yeah, I grew up water skiing. What do you want, right? 
and we did the shark surfing video. And, and, and it, you know, but it was That's amazing. So funny. Yeah. I forgot that was you. Yeah. As you said it, I'm like, I don't know what you're yeah. talking. And then it slowly was yeah. coming back. Yeah. That's yeah. so I, funny. That thing got 6 million hits before they monetized YouTube. Oh, wow. And, yeah, because it was a long time. When yeah, was that? Yeah, 2006. That's when they invented, YouTube was yeah, invented in 2005. I was, I, I, was, I was a YouTube sensation. That was 2005 you know, that they invented here. YouTube. Yeah. That's crazy. Good day, LA. Good morning, LA. You mm -hmm. know, Fox, they, they, you know. Guy serves great white shark, you know? That's like, so funny, <laughs> it's dude. Funny. I can't believe I didn't connect those dots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you I, always, I always go up to people and I try, to, I try to help because I know how hard this sport is. Yeah. Because I struggle with it and I told myself, I'm never, ever going to forget the frustration that I experienced. Yeah. You know, and I, I see new, newer surfers coming in and I always try to correct them. I always try to help. Right? And I always try to encourage. Right? I mean, you it's know, I, I, I just get this from my dad, I, I guess. So it's funny that you say that. I always try to help and I always try to encourage because I had another thought a minute ago that I didn't share. You were talking about um, Sarlo and Dora screaming at you. Yeah. Right? Uh, oh, well, no, it wasn't, Sarlo it wasn't Dora. It was Sarlo. It was this guy named Mickey who was a motorcycle guy. Oh, and, okay. And Dave, he was a friend of Dave White. Dave White grew up on the Malibu Pier. Dave White is one of my surfing idols, by the way. He's he's a realtor in Malibu now, but he's was a big influence on me. Okay. And he, he sold our house in Malibu for us. But Mickey was friends with Johnny Gyro. And Johnny Gyro and these guys were from the Val, but they were locals. They claimed they were locals. And if you got online, they would... I mean, there was fighting, man. Yeah. I've been in my fair share of fights. Some I lost, some I won. Right. But Mickey was nuts. He was a motorcycle guy. Gotcha. It, and he would surf on acid. Forgot to mention he was on acid. <laughs> and, and he'd throw his surf shorts around his neck and surf naked at third point. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Do you think you're going to snake that guy? No. You're, you're, never, you're no. not even going to surf behind him. No. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so I'm glad you clarified that because in yeah. my mind, I was like, the Dora years don't seem to align. No. But okay. When perfect. I was shaping at Natural Progression, though, in 86, Mickey came back to the States for the oh, first time okay. and bought, you know. We're talking Dora now. We're talking Dora because yeah. I worked at Zuma J's. I worked at Zuma J's in Malibu. I was the second employee there in Malibu on, on near the pier, right? And natural progression was the other surf shop. And Robbie Dick and Dean Edwards were two of the shapers there. Dean is a good friend of mine. Dean was the Al Merrick of LA in the late 70s. He was making twin fins that were so cutting edge that, I mean, you could probably put them on a rack today and they're just modern stuff, you know, modern designs. Dean lives in Hawaii now. He's still on making the big boards. Island, right? Yep. Yeah. And Dean, Dean, I'm the competition. They hate Zuma Jays. And for some reason, they let me go into their factory. And I'm going, they're gonna, they're gonna kill. Scott Anderson was the ding repair guy. No way. Oh yeah. So I'm walking in there shaping, and I got Skipper, Skip Engblom from, you know, Zephyr, right? Yeah. I got all of them riding my ass. Like they're they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna kill me. They're gonna either you know mess with my car. You know what they did? You're not you're not done, Melaine. Get the back in there. Finish it up. No 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 no. It's like this. It's like this. It's like this. They helped me. Yeah. You know I, I'll never forget that man. What they did for me, Skipper, Skipper and Dean and all those guys. They 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 molded me. They gave me discipline. They they taught me so much, and I'm so indebted especially scott anderson when years later you know i without scott anderson i wouldn't be here really no sorry no it's okay but um well you know Sc scott scott um scott gave me a home like after um you know I, I wanted to start up shaping again he just you know i wasn't all that close with him but he just he just let me have my way there you know and um, it's Dean and Skipper and and all those guys who, who could have um, they they could have just shined me on, 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they, they could have just said, Fuck you. Yeah. And they, they took me under their wing, you know? So, sorry. I didn't think I was going to get choked up like that, man. Well, so the detail in there that I wanted to ask you about is, um, getting yelled at by Sarlo for your own benefit, by the way. Yes. And then the other part about you saying, I always try to encourage. There's a contrast there. They're almost opposing things. Yeah. I was in the parking lot the other day in Huntington and there was two guys walking out of the water and I just overheard their conversation. And they were talking about kook of the day on Instagram. Right. There was an Instagram post from kook of the day with a guy getting a pocket ride. He wasn't in the barrel at all. He was like grabbing rail and it was barreling way behind him. He was just like out in front of the pocket essentially. And then he claims it super hard as he's <laughs> kicking out of the way. And so kook of the day was making fun of him. And the guys walking by were talking about that post, which I had seen earlier in the day. So I knew what they were talking about. And the guy goes, man, I was so glad for once in that toxic community all of the commenters were shaming kook of the day. They were going, hey, that surfer was just having a good time. Right. Like he was having the most fun of his life. Why do you have to make fun of him? Because he wasn't getting barreled, you know? Right. And so the guy telling the story was actually proud of the commenters for shaming kook of the day. And I thought to myself. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, interesting is what I thought. And I thought uh, that's kind of noble and like well-rounded or open-minded to like cheer for the guy who's just having a good time. Right. And then I thought, no, Shane kook. He is a kook. That is a kook move. And us calling him a kook for not getting barreled. We'll make him better. We'll make him better. Yes. That us calling you a kook, you even making it on here and being called a kook means you're now part of the brethren. We've accepted you as part of the brethren. And part of that is as your older brother, I'm going to, belittle you to get better you you gotta earn your way in because if remember we were having that conversation earlier like if you don't have adversity you will not grow and, and if, if if everybody says oh my gosh you were so amazing yeah so many people come up to me i've had customers come up you know like what kind of board am i going to get john for doing airs i go um First of all, the only aerials you're doing is over the falls. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the only air you get, dude. Um, but, you know, if, if you don't tell the truth, then you're never really going to get air. You know what well, I'm if saying? You don't, if you don't right. tell the truth, you're always going to be eight feet in front of the barrel. Right. Two. Right. Not exactly. getting the vision. Exactly. So I'm going to call you a kook because eventually you're actually going to get the vision that you've only dreamt of. And that claim will be yeah. a lot more meaningful. You don't get to claim barrel if you're just like halfway there. And he wasn't right. even halfway. He was right. like way out in the flats, you know? Yeah. You can't baby in surfing because there's only you. If you if you don't get your act together, it's only you out there. Right. You know? Totally. So, so and, and it's so tough unless you have video of yourself. Like, I'm going to tell you a quick story, okay? So I was... I thought I was ripping, you know, like when I saw myself on video, there's a bunch of guys at third point from the original crew out there because original crew, we were the birth of the shortboard revolution. Right. We are responsible for everything you see today. I was there. And, you know, all of my friends saw, saw themselves surf on video and they quit because they thought they looked differently, Right? And they quit. The beauty about the 80s is that it was so cool. Although people looked awkward, they had their own style. And it was an extension of them. Their personality. Their personality. That style. That's what surfing's about. We've kind of gone into this homogenous, I call them the flying monkeys. They're very talented. Very talented. But they their style is lacking a tad, right? Yeah. But granted, they're doing astounding things. But my friends, I saw myself surf and I went, I, I mean, it was horrifying to me. It is. And, and it was at 40 years old that I got this message from Tim Dion at Becker. He says, yeah, John, you're, you're surfing great, but 
you're not doing any maneuvers. You're just pumping down the line. I went, what do you mean? You know, like, what do you mean? And I, I changed my whole style. I worked on it. I, I mean, it's tough. If you don't get to see what you're doing and you don't get repetition, don't, that's where the wave pools are going to come in. Surfing is going to accelerate with the wave pool because you get muscle memory acceleration. You get to try your maneuvers. Yep. Right? Totally. You know, but, but yeah, think about it. Like my friends saw themselves surf and like, you know, I, I'm not going to name any names, but you know, one of them went into cycling. <laughs> one of them went into fishing, you know, like, like they were doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah. Then. And, and <laughs> we're all friends with Willie Morris. You know, we went to Willie Morris is a bachelor party. Right. And, uh, it was debaucherous. It, it was, it, it was a bloodbath. Tell it. Tell the story. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, we walk on the school bus, man. And, and we had a Japanese friend of ours named Craig Diltz. Okay. And, and, and here I am on the bus. And, and keep in mind, I hung out with all the vowels. I'm a Malibu local, but I hung out with a lot of the vowels. Because you know why? They surfed well. You don't get to be a local and be a kook and go belittle someone from the Val who surfs better than you. You don't get to do that. That's the great thing Because they're better than too. you. Yeah, it's a meritocracy. Okay? So, so Craig Diltz is Japanese, mind you. And everybody's chanting on the bus, the weave, the weave, the weave. What's the weave? And Craig is standing up in the bus. Everybody's cheering. You know, there's a keg. I don't even know where we went. I can't remember. And he whips down his pants and weaves his unit one time between his fingers and then back. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have tiny hands? I, no. He just, <laughs> he was an, an endowed Japanese man. It was astounding. What could the weed possibly be? <laughs> I would not have guessed that. I wouldn't have guessed that. Like, if you, you gave me a are, hundred. Your vowels are insane. You know, the Valley guys were out of their tree. I mean, some of the stuff we used to do, I mean, it's, you got to admit, I mean, the, the newer surfing males a little more subdued than the 80s. We were nuts. I mean, we were the guys from Big Wednesday. You know, we, we were that crazy, you know. And, and I came from Pepperdine. I was in Pepperdine. Right. You know, I, I always say Christianity never stopped me from doing a damn thing. I had more fun than Vegas, right? <laughs> right? It was, it, was, it was nuts. I mean, the parties in Malibu. I had a red van, and I had carpeting in the back, and I would drive around Malibu with a beer between my legs with about 12 people smoking a bong in the back going from party to party. Crazy. It was so much fun. And when I drove drunk, anybody drove drunk in those days, you were super, super cautious. I'm not kidding, man. You, you were paying attention. Yeah. You weren't being an idiot going, oh, what? you know? Yeah. You're the driver. You're drinking. You maintain. Yeah. You take responsibility for everybody in the back of that car. I mean, I, I'm saying this because, you know, we were conscientious. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we were radical, but we weren't stupid. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but it was a time. It was a time in, that we're never totally. going to have again. No, you know? totally. And, and everybody, like I said, it was, it was happy. You know, it was a happy time. Yeah. You know, and, and, and a lot of stuff was starting to happen. Didn't quite like the, the music of the 80s too much because I was more of a rocker from the 70s, yeah. you know? But um, thank God Guns N' Roses came in 87 yeah. and saved me. But, uh, you know. So you reference Val. For the guys that live in the valley? Yeah. Do you know what VAL stands for now? No, 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 no. What? Vulnerable adult learner. Vulnerable adult learner. <laughs> <laughs> Which it kind of has the same connotation. And it's in the surf world. You'll they'll refer to people as VALs, but it's not because they're from the valley. Because it could be there could be a VAL in Hawaii. They'll be like, oh, look at that VAL, or look at that VAL in Florida, look at that VAL in Australia. Right. Vulnerable, adult, vulnerable adult, adult learner. Maybe boomers, right? <laughs> yeah, or it's all these people now with COVID, like everybody's home. So they, you know, now they're spending time outdoors. So there's all these new surfers in the water I, now. So look at all these so Val is vulnerable adult yes, learner. Yes, yes. 
I, I must maintain this information in my brain now. Yeah. Okay. You'll see it okay. all the time now. And to you, you're probably thinking, oh yeah, from the Valley reference. Yeah. Cause that's really what I think of the Val too. Cause I grew up in Southern California and I yeah. know that reference, but now people use it and it's that acronym. I mean, I mean some of the locals, I mean, you know, some of the locals never got a job, you know, like when I, I went to the most radical private school in California. It was like a college. We discussed this. Buckley. Buckley. It's famous. It's famous. Yeah. From, from um, what was the name of the book? Uh, American Psycho. American. Or no, or, uh, or Less Than Zero. Less Than Zero. Less Than Zero. Right? And, you know, like, I, I went to that school and we were raised with, with, with severe discipline. You know, we had to be on our P's and Q's. I mean, you had to have good manners. We were taught manners to shake hands. You know, just different time, you know. Like, surfing was radical then because of the time, right? Um, I think I lost I lost where I was going with that one, but uh, I, I, I am close to 60 now. No, so. I was talking about vowels, and you were talking about the rigor of the school. Oh, yeah, the locals. Locals. So, so the locals, some of them, you know, you surf all your life. You, you, oh, you live your life to surf, and life passes you by. You know, it, you can surf too much, right? Yeah. I mean, it was devastating for me because I, I always say I was born and raised with a silver spoon in my mouth. I'm going to die with a plastic one, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so yeah, I had a good upbringing. It was awesome. But I put myself in, in, in down with the common man, Yeah. right? I never acted like I had famous parents, you know? Because I just, first of all, wasn't in me. wasn't in my nature, right? But when my parents asked me, or no, they demanded I get a job when I was going to college. No, I have surfing to do. I have a social life. I'm not getting a job. You're getting a job. You're not going to, you know, like your sister's going back to chiropractic school and you're getting a job. And I just, you know, I freaked out. So I go, okay, I'll apply. I'll, I'll go out for the lifeguards. I'll do something easy. I show up to the lifeguard training. We're going to do this swim. All these guys are there in Speedos, shaved heads, greasing up in Vaseline. And I'm in Quicksilver shorts with long hair going. I got back in my car and I drove up to Zuma J's and I applied for a job there. And I got a job in something fishy in Malibu as a sushi bar waiter. The moment I realized that I had money in my pocket that I could do whatever I wanted with and I didn't have to ask mom and dad, oh, a light went on. Like, <laughs> oh, this, this is what it is. Oh, I get it. This is awesome, right? Yeah. It's awesome. And the more I do this, the more money I get. Sign me up, right? Yeah. And from there, I met people. I got to work in the restaurant. I got a social life. Um, I got to meet all the locals in Malibu through the surf shop. And when I worked at Zuma J's, I had to be taken down to... South Shore Glassing, which is owned by Jerry Moe, who makes the power pads. You know the power pads in yeah. every surfboard factory? Jerry Moe raised me to, I owe him a debt of gratitude. Dang. He trained me how to make surfboards. Let me watch every single board I got being shaped. I got a board a week for five, almost five years. What? When one board I didn't like, wasn't being used. It was on the rack being sold for another one the next week when I went down to pick up boards. Wow. By the time I was 25, I had owned and ridden 500 surfboards. Easy. Which would probably equate to a lot of information from here to here. Right? Because the more you got underneath your feet, the more knowledge you had. But there's one more element that I did. I paid attention. I paid attention to why they didn't work. I wasn't always right, but I tried to figure out the problem. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you don't even try and you don't like the board and you throw it away and you don't try to fix the problem, right. you're gonna buy the same thing again. Back then we had to measure our noses and our tails to find out how wide they were at 12 inches from the bottom of the board, right? Because if you didn't know your nose and tail measurements, you couldn't figure out your volume. Right. So, so knowing those measurements, like, Hey man, I prefer a 15 inch wide tail. 
because that's where you stand, right? I'm getting off the beaten path, but I'm saying some good stuff right now. That's, it fits into the... It's good for the, for, for the listener because where you stand is the most important place on your board. How wide it is in the center can be deceiving because you don't know how wide the nose is. You don't know how wide the tail is. Right. So you're going to buy the same length, the same thing. We've got leaders... That's okay, but where are the leaders displaced, right? What if your nose is 19 and your tail's 11? That board's not going to work the same. you got the same amount of leaders, but you're totally lost. So you should still measure your nose and tail. And that's what I learned from Jerry Moe at South Shore. They did all our glassing. They did all our shaping. And we, I took the orders behind the counter at Zuma J's. Shane Haran came in to Zuma J's. I, I'm on... Um, Instagram with Shane and Shane's shaping now. He's making some killer boards for the average surfer. He's doing a great job. And that was an amazing time. Um, but something happened um, back then that forever changed my life. Um, aside from, you know, meeting Dean and working at Zuma J's, uh, piping hot wetsuits dropped a surfer off on our doorstep for the Sunkiss Pro, I think. 80 or something. Sun Kiss Pro, we had the bikini contest at Malibu. Buttons was there. And, you know, Terry Richardson, Richo, was dropped off on my doorstep and they needed a place to stay. And so, well, this guy can stay at our house. He was there, there to sell wetsuits? No, he was there to compete. Oh, okay. Terry Richardson was on the top 16 yeah, for yeah, yeah. 10 years, right? Yeah. But he didn't have a place to stay. So, while I was working at Zuma J's, piping hot wetsuit, dropped them off on our doorstep. Gotcha. Can you find them a place to stay? And I took them in with my roommate, Rich Thies, um, in college. We had a round guest house above Duke's. I lived above Duke's for about five years in a round house. In Malibu? Yeah. Yeah. So we took Terry around and he took my brand new twin fin that I had. And he goes, mate, the waves are small. Can I borrow your board? I go, yeah, sure. No, no problem. So he takes the board in the back, takes a grinder, and whacks down my fins because he didn't like them. They're too big. <laughs> like, um, I won a bunch of contests on that board, um, by the way. With but, his fins or with yours? Yeah, with, with the fins. When, it, when he ground the fins down on that board, it made it work really well. Wow. So I won a lot of contests on it. But Terry, Terry went down, but we wound up being really good friends with him. We didn't really surf with him. We didn't know he shaped. We didn't know how good of a surfer he really was, right? But we took him to Disneyland. We took him to Universal Studios and we became buddies. And we went over to see him in Australia and we stayed with him. And then when he came back in 86, he bought us both boards that he shaped. At that time, I was riding Channel Islands um, through Zuma J's because I got Al Merrick to do the Zuma J's. Oh, and, there, okay. and, and Dean and Natural Progression were glassing El Merrick's boards at the time, too. Okay. Um, but sh Terry shaped us both boards. And they, were, they blew anything I've ever ridden away. Really? And he shaped them with a freaking sure form. No way. Zuma J's gave him a contract for 200 boards, and those boards were out the door. He shaped them all. He used a planer to cut one little thing, and then the rest was a sure form. 200 were in they, a hot box. Were they twin fins? They, they, were, they were thrusters okay. at the time because it was 86. Okay. And Brian Hilbers rented out the shack at Winding Way in Malibu to Terry. Wow. Right? It, like, like I said, Brian at the time, I mean, Brian, Brian, Brian's a walking, talking encyclopedia of surfing. He's an amazing design head. And, you know, trying to understand what he says is, is, is a talent in and of itself. Sure. But, I, I mean, for me... You know, he, he gave me my language, how to speak and communicate while shaping. Yeah. I learned all that from Brian Hilbers. Terry Richardson, I learned a lot. I, I watched him shape all, almost all the 200 boards. Um, Terry is an amazing surfer and he's still doing great. He still shapes, but he works in the mines and, you know, he won the Owen Bali Pro. But I've got so many people that are behind me, so many people that influence me, um, you know, people go, what qualifies you to be a shaper? My whole history, you know, yeah. like, like, you know, being a competitor, being in the industry, taking surfboard orders, thousands, thousands of their surfboard orders behind that counter in Zuma Chase. Uh, you know? What were you studying at Pepperdine? The shortest 
um, major possible. I stayed there for five and a half years. I was like, I better pick something. Yeah. Radio broadcasting. Oh. It was, so- it was amazing. I loved it. I really did have my own little radio show. Good for you. It, it was really, really great. And I, I had a fine arts minor. You're a natural. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Here with my, a microphone in front of you, my, I can tell. My mom took me to Hanna-Barbera because I used to draw really kind of um, crude cartoons, but they were really funny and everybody loved them. I, I went to the, to the House of Lords in England with one of our, our friends. I made some jokes that made the British people laugh. Um, but I had my cartoon book with me and my mom took me to Hanna-Barbera because she wanted me to be a cartoonist. Because, oh, you're so artistic, you know. Yeah. And then the art teacher at Buckley would say, oh, you know, what a great painting you did. And they would go, and then they would touch up your painting, you know, the teacher. And then, you know, they make it look good, not me. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they touch it up, it makes good. But, um, but, it, but the surfboards made me into an artist. I had to learn to air spray because there's nobody to do my air sprays for me in Hawaii now. Okay. Right? So, so all my artistic abilities came out with the surfboards. 